Wait, wait, no, 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 no. Yeah, like this, like this. Hold on. Okay. Okay, thank you everybody. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. I think that I have watched Emmet grow from pretty much its inception. We've, some of you may have been guests in our home, I think 15, 16, 17, 18 years ago in Muncie, in the olden days, in the Stone Ages, and we've, it's just every time I come to an Emmet event, it inspires me, it really does. And it's been not just transforming community, the community, it's transformative. Rabbi Rutenberg, such incredible energy, such vision, such passion, and that goes through the whole mainframe, everyone, Rabbi Kraft, uh, everybody who's here in Emmet just reflects that incredible desire, passion, that Kirov, which is so wonderful, and I'm inspired too. Our subject tonight, I think, is probably the most important subject, the most important ingredient in life. We ask people, if you ask people on the street, what's the most important ingredient in your relationship, your marriage relationship, in any relationship? And they'll normally say, someone on the street will say, well, love. I want to experience love. Love is the magical byword. You ask people that are a little bit more developed and you say, well, in a marriage relationship, <clears throat> what is the most important ingredient? And they'll tell you something more important than love, and that is respect. Respect. Because if you're respected, then there's a relationship. If you're not respected, you're being used, essentially. It's mutually beneficial, <clears throat> but it's not genuine. It's not deep. We have to have genuine respect for each other. But if you ask someone that's really a little bit more developed, they'll tell you what the most important ingredient in marriage is. And that is something that's not a feeling like love, it's not a value like respect, it's trust. Because if you can trust your spouse, if you can really trust your spouse, then you're connected. If you don't really trust, you know, if we want to take in a marriage, the ultimate marriage, the one that at the core is the, if you want to put a litmus test into the value of a marriage, if a spouse knows that, a woman knows that, if she was one of all the women in the world, and her husband was the only guy in the world, the only guy, and he could marry whoever he wants. They're all lined up against the wall. He can marry whoever he wants. If she was secure knowing that he would not look to the right, he would not look to the left, he wouldn't look anywhere, he would make just a beeline right for her. He trusts, she can trust the relationship. That is a really secure marriage. And the same goes the other way. Botach balev bal. You know we sing Aishas Chayel Miyimsa. You want to have an Aishas Chayel. We all want to be an Aishas Chayel Miyimsa. Where do we find an Aishas Chayel? Botach balev bal. When there's true bitachon, when there's true trust, when there's an absolute fidelity that runs much higher than <clears throat> on a simplistic level. It's a genuine trust, a genuine complete a belief in the other, a trust in the other. It's something that's hard even to describe. But when we have trust, then we have the solid inner core, the titanium, the spine of the relationship, and around that we can build. I think I might have said in the past that our marriage relationship on a mystical plane, the way God created husband and wife is a fantastic institution, a husband and wife, the whole dynamic of marriage is really reflective of our relationship with God. We're the Kala, Knesset Yisrael, Kala Kru Yibnima, we're the Kala, Hashem is the Chassan. Now our relationship with God is built, is predicated on four, four critical pillars. 
and they're all in the Shema. I'm just going to tell it to you in a nutshell. The first one is Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. The first one is you and I are one. Hashem, my soul is taken from you. You and I are one. We're inseparable. I don't know of anything else. The first of the Ten Commandments, I am Hashem, your God. Don't have any other gods in my face. Total fidelity, total trust. Echad. That's the basis. That's the number one. Number two of our relationship with the divine. Baruch Shem. Next word. Kavod Malchus When we absolutely respect the greatness, the Malchus, we have true respect. That's the second ingredient. The third ingredient, the Ahavta. When we're selflessly devoted to the other, the Ahavta Ava is the feeling of love is only a byproduct of a selflessness and a giving, and we're there for the other. Then we have Ahava, and the fourth and the most vital completion of the pillar is just like with Hashem we are studying his will we're studying his Torah marriage is a consistent journey of examining studying and trying to understand my spouse I really want to learn my spouse I really want to understand what makes them tick what's important to them it's a lifetime journey because they are wired entirely different to me completely different and the more that I'm able to strip myself of myself, divest myself of myself, and understand my spouse, the more we're bonded, the more we're connected. Same as with Hashem, in a certain way, our marriage mirrors our relationship with the Divine. But the first and number one thing is Batach Ba Lev Baila. Lev is something we say the heart, but really lev means the mind. Lev is always really, normally when the Torah talks about lev, it's talking about the mind. It means it's something that is, it's not something that I can even, it's, it's something that is at the very core of the relationship. Trust is something you feel. He gets me. She respects me. She really understands me. She, she really, we can't, we are one. We are one. We don't entertain any other thoughts of anybody else because we really appreciate and celebrate the unity, the bond that connects us. Now that's a very, very hard concept to have trust, to trust a spouse, because trust, as we always say, is something that is earned. And as we travel along the road of marriage, trust becomes breached. We lose our ability to trust. We were expecting you home, and you're not home. We're expecting you to be present, and you're looking at your phone always. You know, there's 101 things that we do as we move along the journey of life that detract, that take away from trust. And so we feel, well, we started out the journey with a lot of trust. I accepted the ring. We got married. We gave our marriage vows. We trusted each other. But deep down, there's often a feeling that, where was I? What was I thinking? <laughs> like, and trust, because we are thinking people, we're real people, we're human people, so very often our trust feels breached, and it's very hard to trust, because we build on experiences that we've had with our spouse along the journey, along the way, and so we can only build on what we've experienced. And we've experienced a lack of trust. We've experienced things that have taken away from the trust. We don't think that it's earned. We don't think that they're trustworthy. We don't think that we can truly rely on them. And it's very hard. And then we start to try and build trust. Well, where do you get trust from? How do you trust if there's no trust? Where do you bring it out? Pull a rabbit out of the hat. Where do you get trust from? We know it's very important, but how can we trust our spouse so that there is, at the very essence of the relationship, a real core? And what I'm going to share with you today is something that's very fundamental, very vital for the essence of marriage, to be able to strengthen the core, the batach ba lev baila, and if we do this, there's v'shala lo echsa, the home is secure, the home is solid. You know, children 
can actually sense, they have antennas, very finely tuned antennas on their heads, they can sense the unity and connectivity, the dependency, the love, they can sense the strength of connection and children are really standing in the home sometimes when there's friction and when there's fighting and when there's arguing and when there's a power struggle the children are really sitting on the it's like they're in the west coast you, all, you never know when the earthquake is going to come when the tectonic plates are going to move and shift so you're never on secure ground and they have a challenge building trust because they never know if you never know if you can really rely on the other person you never know whether the environment is solid secure embracing nurturing then it's hard for yourself and some of us come from homes come from backgrounds where we ourselves were criticized we ourselves were stripped of the ability to have trust our own trust was taken away from us so it becomes doubly hard it's such a hard journey it's such an impossible mountain to climb how do you trust the other person when where do we get it from so what we're discussing today is really really important because if trust is the vital ingredient of the relationship we want to be able to get it and i think that there's one area you know that we can all we can all trust there's one area in which we can all have blind trust we think we like to think that we can't trust because trust has to be earned but the truth is we all have a capacity to trust we see it when we were little children I have this little gig that I have with my I used to have it with my children I have it with my grandchildren but on Shabbos I bring them onto my lap and you know they have a turn everyone has a turn with Zaidi and we do a little um, we sing together but I take their hands they're sitting on my lap and we go and we do all kinds of funny things and we you know and they love it you know now there's some grandchildren that they go for it and they let their hands totally loose and we do it and we go and we do all kinds of funny things and they have in the time of their life and then they look at me and I look at them I'm telling you they could ask that time five portions of ice cream whatever they want they can have <laughs> you, know, like, you, you know me we're just connected and then you have some grandchildren that are like stiff and they're afraid you know what's they going to do with me and you kind of try a little bit and then you just put them down and you say okay <laughs> and that's really <clears throat> children have an ability i remember when i was not long after we were married my first girl um, my wife had to go out at night i was babysitting and um, i had a work to do i had to prepare for something and i put my i unceremoniously dumped my two and a half year old in her crib and i said good night <laughs> and closed the door <laughs> and i came down to the study and she was crying now normally you know what it's like you know a child is crying so you you have like a few minutes and then the voice starts to subside and the sobs go down and they kind of resign to the to the room and you know they, you hear them a little bit playing with the toys and banging against the wall and then finally you know you know it's it's safe and they're asleep heaven help if you open the door when they start crying because then they know that if they cry you take them out and it's just a never-ending cycle so here I was and I'm downstairs and I'm not gonna let this girl out but she's screaming and crying take me out hi help me get me out I hate it and she's banging against the wall of the crib now this was a strange because after 10 minutes she's still going full force and my heart was like feeling, oh. <laughs> I'm really feeling guilty and uh, I'd like to put in my earplugs and close the door to the study but I, I just like this is really you know like I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm torturing her and I stepped out and I'm going upstairs and tiptoeing so she shouldn't hear me and she says Abba I know you're there I know you're there take me out I know I love you now 
that time, of course, you know, like, there's no rationale anymore. And the door's open and she's in my arms and I have to deal with her for another half an hour, an hour, and it's okay. See, when someone trusts someone else, when there's a total trust, the connection is whole and it just, there's no logic. The magic of trust is, this is why, this is the essence of a relationship. A relationship that we have is always built on finite understanding. The other person can do X, Y, Z for me. The other person makes me feel like X, Y, Z. The other person and I share the same values and the same goals. All of that is logic. Trust is moving into a zone that is not logical. It's transcendent. And that's where there can be a soulmate connection. That's where we can connect where it's beyond the rationale, it's beyond the logic. And so it is with the divine, with Hashem. When our relationship with God is built on what are you doing for me and what am I doing for you, then the relationship is very tenuous. It's always, you know, when there is bitachon, when there's emuna, when there's belief and bitachon trust that completes the belief, it's a totality of me and you being one, that I'm blind, I'll walk into the sea. That's why the Gemara says, perhaps, kosher zivuge shaladam, the essence of making a marriage work is like kriyas yamsuf. It's like jumping into the sea, because it makes no sense. It feels like I'm jumping off a cliff. Why can I trust you? It's not logical. How do I know that you're really there for me? But when we're able to develop and cultivate trust, trust is moving into a zone that's not logical. And that's why trust is at the very core of a soulmate connection. That's what really is the glue that bonds us together. And Hashem wants us. Marriage is a journey of the supernatural. It's a soulmate. It's a spiritual journey where I have to leave the rational, even though it's not fair. My mind tells me I can't trust but I have to trust and I'll share with you that the one area which I believe in every marriage we need to develop blind trust one base area and if we have this then our marriages look different they have a base they have a foundation on which we can build on and that is, it's true, trust needs to be earned, and sometimes trust is lost. But we can trust that when our spouse is acting in ways that drive us up the creek, up the wall, hurt us, that we don't like, maybe they're expressing all their indignation and we're feeling disrespected, or maybe we're feeling he doesn't get me, he doesn't understand me, and we're expressing ourselves very, very strongly. Well, the other, if you trust that your spouse is not being malicious, does not want to hurt me, my spouse doesn't want to hurt me, I trust blind me, my spouse, my spouse loves me, just they are frustrated. Just they are right now overwhelmed. Right now they're feeling very hurt. They're feeling very indignant. But the essence of the relationship is there. If I have blind trust, if I can always go back to the essence of the relationship and I trust that the relationship, the other is not trying to hurt me, they're not being malicious, then we don't start a power struggle. You see, the minute that I feel that I'm being mistreated, the minute that I feel I'm being disrespected, I have to stand up for my rights. I'm putting on my boxing gloves. I'm putting on my bulletproof vest. Do you know what you're telling me? Do you know what I do for you? You know how... And before long, it's the smallest thing. Sometimes fights start and you don't even know where they started from. It was so small, like, like what's the, where the, what, the, how did this molo become such a mountain? But once we're triggered 
And once we're feeling hurt and we are feeling that the other person is against us, we're engaged in a logical power struggle. It's a survival of the fittest. We're now engaged in a fight for life. Once we trust that the other person doesn't hate us, doesn't, is, not, is, not, is not out to get us, the other person is just feeling overwhelmed. They have feelings and they're entitled to their feelings. Then we're out of the power struggle zone. We can start to deal with it maturely. We can start to listen. And just like when my little child is banging on the closet because they want to have the candies that are on the top shelf, and they're banging and stamping and stomping and screaming, Abba, I hate you! I wish I was never born, you know, you know, get me, give me those candies. Well, we know they're a little child, we love them, we're there for them, they're going to calm down. Sorry, sweetie, I'd love to give it to you, but it's not good for your teeth. You already had three candies, not now. No, come to the table, eat supper, and then I'll give you. So we can do it, because we're not in a power struggle. We know they're just overwhelmed, they're just dealing with something, and then we can deal with it. So once we trust that the other person is not out to get us, the other person is not pressing our buttons anymore, our survival buttons. The other person is in pain. The other person has a legitimate grievance. They're right, they're okay, everybody can have grievances. We can start to listen, we can start to calm down, we can start to engage, and we can do the work of building the relationship. So the key for trust to us in a relationship is not necessarily that I can trust you're going to come home on time because I told you to come home on time, or that you're going to know to bring home flowers. I don't have to remind you to do certain things, or I trust you on this, that, and the other, 101 other things, small things, big things, because, you know, you failed me in the past, and I don't have, you don't have a great credit record, a great credit score that I'm going to trust you're going to, you know, you're going to come through with flying colors. But I trust that you're not trying to ignore me. I trust that you would like, because at the core, every spouse would like to be the best wife and the best husband. Every one of us, really. I know that my wife would like to be the best wife. A husband would like to be the best husband. We've just got a journey to take. It's just a journey. It's a life journey. Now, I want to share with you why trusting is so difficult for us and why we automatically put on our boxing gloves and it's so hard to trust. And the reason why it's so hard to trust, if you analyze it at the very source, the, deep, the reason why we can't trust our spouse is... What's that? We don't trust ourselves. The people that trust, if we can trust ourselves, it's much easier to trust others. Trust begins with something within ourselves. If we're secure, the more secure we are in our own skin, the more confident we are about who we are, the more we're able to share that trust that we have, we see the world with the prism of our own life experience. So if we can't trust ourselves, it's much, much harder to trust others. It's much, much harder to trust Hashem. So it starts with trusting myself. It starts with finding that inner security that I'm okay. I'm good. I'm fine. I can trust myself. That's a very, very big journey in life. That's a very, very important journey in life. I can trust. Once I know that I can trust, you see, when we got married, every one of us, when we got married, there was a true trust. You know, when the Jewish people went out of Egypt, it's considered like a marriage with Hashem. There was a marriage. And when we're in a state of beginning, the stages of marriage, there's romance, there's excitement. You went after me into the wilderness, you trusted me. The marriage, the signature of the marriage is trust. 
And in a marriage, I want to come back to that original state of when we got engaged and we were enraptured with each other and we trusted each other. We want to go back to that state that we are, we're good. We want to go back to that state that defines innately our relationship. Because every marriage relationship is built at the beginning. There's a gift at the beginning. If it was a forced marriage, if it was one of those marriages where there was absolutely no lechtech achrei ba midbar, then there's something very vital that's missing. Because every marriage has, in its initial stages, a state where you just lechtech achrei ba midbar, I trust you, I'm giving over my life to you, I trust you're going to be the spouse that's going to take care of me, that's going to understand me, that's going to love me, that's going to care for me, that's going to provide for me, otherwise I wouldn't get married. So there is that element there. When that element is there, we'll go, we'll go to the end of the world for each other. But then reality sinks in, things sinks in, and we go, things go downhill from there. So we want to bring it back to that Zohar Tiloch. We want to constantly remind ourselves that there's an Ahavas Kelulu Yisaych, that we are one, that we are one, that we trust. You're not there to get me. You love me. Well, in order to do that, I have to affirm, I trust myself. I love myself. I am okay. I'm good. See, deep down, and this is true of all of us, deep down we all harbor fears and insecurities. Fears that Hashem doesn't like us. We're not worthy. We have little ghosts and gremlins and demons in the mind that sometimes emerge from the rafters. You know what I'm talking about? And they go, sometimes they make all kinds of ghastly whispers and they share with us that, you know, that feeling that I'm going to Gehenna Hashem doesn't like me. I'm not worthy. It's not good. And so, when I'm in my own survival mode, how can I trust someone else if I don't trust myself? I have to trust myself. I'll tell you a thought that I had this Pesach, actually, in Eretz Yisrael. Very, very interesting thought, and I'll share it with you. Because I think it's really, really important. It's fundamental. You know, in the Haggadah, we talk about four sons. The Chacham, the Rasha, the Tam, and the Eni Yidei Elishal. I think that we're all sometimes part, part Chacham, part Rasha. We're all the son of Hashem. Hashem is our father. But anyway, the Rasha is very, very interesting. This Rasha is sitting at the table. He's part of the Thanksgiving meal. He's part of the family meal. He's part of the Pesach Seder. And we give him a really rough time. I mean, he asked this innocuous question. What is this all about for you guys? What are you doing these rituals for? Boy, do we give it to him. We say to him, boy, af ata hakiyas shinov. Blunt his teeth, knock out his teeth. Give him a hell, give him, give him such a punch. I mean, come on. He's sitting at the table. Let's treat him now. We're taught to treat our kids nicely, aren't we? I mean, we want, it. we want him to stay at the table. And then we say to him, if you were there, you wouldn't be redeemed. Now that's not true, because he's here at this Seder. So if he's here at this Seder, we know everybody that's at the Seder is part of the soul, the framework of the 600,000 souls that came out of Egypt. Otherwise, he would have died with the four fifths that died in Egypt. So he did come out, and he's here. So what do we have to rub salt in his wounds and tell him that, you know, if you would be there, you would have never come out. Like, what kind of chinuch is that? <laughs> What's going on? And the most incredible thing is that if you look in the Torah, 
These four sons are all different psukim in the Torah. If you look at the Torah, there's an entirely different response to the son that asked this question. The wicked son, you read it in Pashas Boy, when Ki Yomru Aleichem Bnechem, when your sons are going to ask you, Moha Avoida What's this, what's this Avoida that you're doing? You answer him very respectfully. You know what you tell him? Pesach Hul Hashem. It's a Pesach. Hashem lifts us up. And he jumps over our houses and he loves us. When he destroyed the Egyptians, Benokfoyes Misraim Vespatenu Hitzel, and he saved us. And you know what the people, when they heard that answer from Moshe, you know what it says they did in the Pasuk? Anybody know? They all bowed down. They were so grateful. And Rashi says they were so grateful because they heard they're going to have children and a continuum. What are they so grateful for? That they're going to have kids that are wicked? <laughs> well, what's going on here? And why do we answer so differently in the Torah to what we answer in the Haggadah? My friends, my friends, my friends, please listen closely because what I'm about to share with you is so, so, so important to each and every one of us because all of us have little voices inside of us that say, What am I doing over here? What am I doing over here? We all have some little strains of wickedness that surface from time to time. We don't know from where, from what, from how, but we just feel it's futile, it's helpless. God, why did you stick me in here? What's it all about? Uh, Just like... And then we hear a voice. You wicked guy! You know where you're going. You're going to be raked over the fires, the coals of purgatory. Ha-ha! <laughs> and we hear that voice inside of us. af ata hake sinov And you know what we need to know? Echad chacham ve'echad rosh Hashem loves us. That's just our brain down here. There's cause, there's consequence. Down here, we're measuring with finite we're feeling, you know, I wasn't good to Hashem, so Hashem's not good to me and He doesn't like me. But in essence, I have to transcend and rise and trust Hashem loves me. Hashem loves me. And the Torah gives us the real answer. The real answer is, don't worry, Hashem jumps over every Jewish home, even though they were in the Memtas Shari Tumah, even though they were indistinguishable from the Egyptians, even though you're asking, Maha avoid Lachem, Hashem loves you and He jumps over your homes and He destroys the Egyptians, but you, He's taking you out of Egypt. And when the Jewish people heard that, what did they hear? They heard a message, we are children of Hashem. Sometimes we get into a tizzy, sometimes we're banging the closet, we're screaming, God, give me those candies, I need this, why are you doing this to me? And we get a little dysfunctional, but you know what? Hashem loves us. Bonim, Atem, Lashem, Elokechem. We're all children of Hashem. Whether we're doing the will of God or whether we're not doing the will of God, we're always Bonim. Le'olam, Atem, Kruim, Bonim, Rameir says. And that's the message that we have to internalize. That even though our brain, our mind, our logical sense of self is telling us that maybe we're damned, maybe we're doomed, maybe this is unfair, maybe Hashem doesn't like me. The journey of life is a journey of trust. The journey of life is knowing, no, it's okay. Hashem, you love me. Hashem, it's going to be okay. Hashem, I'm going to see you eye to eye, and I'm going to be in your arms, and you're going to be in my arms. I'm going to let loose and let go and trust, even though everything in me wants to stiffen up. I mean, making sense. So, you, are, you, are we on the same wavelength? Yeah, we're together. So, it's a journey. When I'm secure in my own, when I can trust myself, I can begin to trust my spouse. So, even though my spouse is reading me the riot act, I came home late, I failed her. I didn't bring home what she expected. I messed up, and she's making it into a major course celebrity and being charged with a grand felony. I don't know what I did exactly, but it's terrible. I trust. It's okay. I can listen. I can hear. I can process. I can, because it's not personal. I don't have to defend myself. I don't have to live in the rational zone. I can trust. She loves me. 
she's there for me, but she's frustrated. Let me hear and process and understand instead of just going straight back into attack mode. Trust is the essence of the relationship. It's what makes it work. And it's the same on the other side. Yes, he didn't do this and he didn't do that and he's not so excited and he's not interested and he's, he's, he seems to be distracted and he's not present. I trust you trust me. Now let me find, once I have that trust as a basis, now I can respond in ways that engender and empower and bring out the core deepest desire. Once I trust my spouse is really wants to be the best spouse, now I can act in ways that cultivate that ability of my spouse to be their real self. But until then, if I don't trust, I am going to be putting paraffin on the fire and the fire, the flames are going to be going all over the place. And at the source of it all, it's all about trust. It starts with trust. I have to trust and I have to trust myself. I'm frustrated. The source of it all is that we're frustrated with ourselves. We are nervous about ourselves. We're not secure. We're walking on our own thin ice. I'm going to share with you just one more thing on this because this is so fundamental, so important. I'll share with you an idea, a thought that also occurred to me a while back, but it's, it's a valuable thought. Everybody has heard of Nachum Gamzu. Nachum Gamzu, very famous in the Gemara. Nachum Gamzu was the Rebbe of Rebbe Akiva. These days of Sphere, it's all about Rebbe Akiva. Rebbe Akiva, who always used to say everything that Hashem does, Everything Hashem does is for the good. What happened to Rabbi Akiva once? He was on a journey and he had with him his donkey and a fire and a, and a flame and a rooster, a rooster and the donkey dies and the wind blows out. Nobody wants to take him in for hospitality in the town and he's out there in the forest and the wind blows out the flame and the donkey dies, and the rooster is eaten by a fox, and on everything he says, whatever you do, Hashem, is for the good. And sure enough, the next morning, everything was for the good, his life was saved, he was able to see. And I think perhaps what the Gemara is saying really, and it's a little deeper, sometimes, you know, we all move along the journey of life with these three things, with a donkey, a flame, and a rooster. Yes, yes. We have a donkey. This is our body. The beast of burden. We have a flame. We have a neshama. And we have a rooster that's able to distinguish between light and darkness, night and day. We have the ability to have free choice. And sometimes we're walking along the journey of life and the donkey dies. We feel, I'm done. I want to hide under the covers. I'm finished. Get me out of here. I resign. I give up. And then the soul goes out. You ever had that? Everybody has that sometimes. We just feel, and we lose the ability to make rational, logical choices between right and wrong, night and day, it just everything goes out, it's all dark. And if in all circumstances of life we're able to say, whatever Shem does is for the good, I trust you, I trust you, I trust you. It doesn't mean that you hate me. It doesn't mean that I'm done and I'm cooked. It doesn't mean that because nobody's giving me hospitality and I'm feeling lonely, rejected, dejected, which is what we feel when our spouse is not on our page. We feel alienated. We feel alone. We feel rejected. We feel the pain of being out in the wilderness, out in the dog kennel, sent out to pasture. But you know, if we trust, we're not alone. We're okay. We're okay. Okay, everything is for the good. You, you don't mean to hurt me. I trust you that you're not trying to hurt me. It's okay. It's going to be good. When I have that mindset, everything's going to be good. That's very important. I want to share with you an idea of Nachum Mishkamzu, but we'll leave it for another time. But it's all the same idea. I have to trust, even though inside of me I'm feeling so empty, there's such a hole inside of me that sucks me down into the ground and I just feel like horrible, a pit in the stomach. 
if I can trust, if I can trust, if I can trust, then the journey moves on and I grow. I build the muscle of trust. I build the core of the relationship. I build my own inner core. I build my core with the divine. I'm growing in the journey of life, the essence of life. Emuna and Bitochen. This is the very essence of life. This is everything. That's why when I trust myself and I understand that if I'm engaging a situation where I'm feeling alone and I'm feeling misunderstood and I'm feeling hurt and <coughs> I'm feeling in pain, I trust. It's going to be good. It's okay. I'm okay. It's fine. You know, Sarah Emenu, we, we, we question our spouse. A lot of our own frustrations, we always transfer to the people that are closest to us, that we depend on. So when we're young, we transfer all our angst and our disappointment and our hurt on our parents. And when we get a little bit older, we move it to our spouse. When we're married, we move it to our spouse. And we have to trust, it's just, my spouse is experiencing a little funk, a little junk. It's not my junk, it's okay. It's okay. I can trust. That's very, very key. Very, very key. So how do we move beyond this? What do we do? Practical modalities, practical tools to help strengthen when the chips are down and we're feeling like, ah, I got to put on my boxing gloves. I got to defend myself. I got to scream. What do we do to trust? that my spouse is not out to get me. It's okay. It's good. We're soulmates. Remember how we got married. We have us kululuy I can trust. You know, the biggest challenge we have in marriage is when our mind goes to those places that if all the men or all the women would be lined up, we wouldn't go and make a beeline to our spouse. We would actually be looking around <laughs> to see where we went wrong and where we could now go right. Deep down somewhere that creeps in those thoughts, Hashem says, Lo Elohim Don't entertain those thoughts. There's an emotional infidelity. Trust, trust, trust. And so I have to trust that Hashem divinely engineered. One of the questions I hear many, many times is, how do I know that my spouse is really supposed to be my spouse? There's a Pasha in the Torah of divorce, isn't there? So clearly not everybody is made for everybody. So how am I supposed to trust that my spouse is really my spouse? Creeps in. Maybe I could have done better. Hmm. <laughs> the truth is, even if an angel would come down, I used, you know, sometimes in, in or Sameach, people would, boys would say, you know, if only Hashem would show me the truth, if only a Malach would come and tell me the Emes, I would jump, I would accept the Torah, everything. And I tell the people, I say, you know, if uh, an angel, a fiery angel, right now just came in through the window, you know, just came in through the window, and he's hovering over here, and he proclaims to all of us, I am a messenger of Hashem, and I have come to tell you all, Hashem is there, and he's watching you, and your every move, and everything you do, you're going to be accountable. And then the Malach says, and I'm going to prove to you that I'm an angel. Watch me. And he dances around, fiery angel, and he says, watch this. And water falls from the floor in the center of the room. And he jumps into the water, and he's a fire, and the fire consumes the water. And then he jumps out, and he says, and I'm telling you from God, fear him. And he zips away right through the window. Now, how long do you think that we would be enveloped with a fear of Hashem? <laughs> How long do you think that that experience is going to grip us and we're going to be 613 mitzvahs? <laughs> Two days, three days? Till Shabbos. Till Shabbos. <laughs> After a couple of shots, <laughs> the Kiddush is all over. <laughs> Okay, it won't last long, because we're humans, we have 
a fantastic ability somehow or other to minimize, to forget. We're always living in doubt. We're always living in insecurity. We're always questioning. The way we're built by Hashem, our finite cre the creation, the way that we're, the way our, our, our cerebral, our minds are wired is to constantly, we're constantly questioning, we're constantly forgetting. So even if we have proof, even if we have an epiphany, we all have moments when we know that this is the truth, this is my spouse, this is my, my light of my life. Our job is to develop emuna. Hashem says, I don't want you to see it. We live in the dark. Our job is sometimes we have the lights go on and we're able to experience and be inspired and we experience the love and the respect and the trust and then the lights go out. Our job is to cultivate it. Emanti, I believe, ki adabe, because I speak and I say it out and I trust and I affirm it and I say it all the time. And so I have to Affirm to my spouse constantly, you are the soulmate and the love of my life. I don't go to sleep without thanking my wife for everything she did for me and thanking Hashem. You know, there's a story I'll share with you. I'll close with this story. But I'll just develop a little bit if I can because this is very important. <laughs> there was a couple. We'll finish with this story because it's a very powerful story. There was a couple that came to Rav Arush in Yerushalayim. They didn't have any children for many years and they were looking for a bracha to have children. Looking for a bracha. <laughs> they'd gone to the Zvila, they'd gone to I don't know, to, um, to the Noam Ali Melech, they'd gone to the Kosel for 40 days, they'd done all the things that they could do, said to Hillam <laughs> countless times, and they were married for a number of years, they didn't have children, and they went to Rav Arush and they said, Rav Arush, can you help us? Can you help us have children? So Rav Arush said to them, he said, I can give you a way that you can have children, but I'm not going to share it with you, because what I'm going to tell you, you're not going to listen to anyway. That's pretty cool. So they looked at Rav Arush, they said, you know, really? You, you know how we could have children and you're not going to share with us? He says, yeah, I can't share it with you because it's futile. You're not going to listen to what I have to say. He said, what? I, we'll do anything. And the lady started crying. She says, Rabbi, you have a way that we can have children. Please, share it with us. Why are you not sharing it with us? He says, because I know you're not going to listen. How many years have you not had children? She said, 12 years. And what do you do at night? She said, For, at night I, I, we soak, I, I soak my bed in tears. I, every simcha I go to, the pain, I see my siblings with, with children and my friends. I, it's just beyond. I, I, I'm not surviving. It's so painful. She says, I know. That's why I, what I share with you, you're not going to listen. She says, I promise you, tell me, please. You're not allowed. Don't do this to me. She said, okay, you really want me to share it with you? She said, yes. She said, okay, I want you to go home. And I want you to thank Hashem for 10 minutes every night that you don't have children. Trust that He knows what's good for you. Trust Him implicitly and thank Him that you don't have children. She said, what? You want me to thank Hashem that I don't have children? I should thank Hashem that I don't have children? What are you... Are you? I mean, I want to have children. I don't want to. He said, I told you you're not going to listen. I told you. That's why I didn't want to share it with you. They went home, and she said, listen, Rav Arush said, we should do this. Let's just do it. I don't know. <laughs> you know, let's try it. And crying, she said, Hashem, you know what's good for us. I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. Thank you for not giving us children, because you know what's good for us. It was murder. But she took that leap of faith. She did it. Within a year, they had a baby boy, and he was the sandic at their first bris. He was the sandic. And then they had another child. And what he was saying is, sometimes we've got to jump into the sea. There's a leap of faith that's being demanded of us. And until we make that leap of faith, the waters can't split. There's just no splitting. It's just constantly we're standing before a wall. 
Sometimes we're standing before our spouse. You know, this is the essence. I can't explain it enough. This is the essence of Judaism. This is the essence of marriage. How much do I really embrace and trust? My spouse is my soulmate and my passport to Gan Eden. And this is the medium through which I am going to realize my perfection and nothing could be better and nothing could be greater. I'm not interested in, in entertaining thoughts about anyone else or anything else. And I am on a journey to trust them. In Or Semech, in Yerushalayim, there was once a, uh, a boy who was part of a program. He came in, he slipped into the yeshiva, and he was there for a, about a year. He was in the yeshiva for a year. He was already in the Gemara Shia, And um, they had to check out his lineage for something or whatever. And it transpired that they, they checked out that his mother was not really Jewish or whatever. And so... Rev, one of the Rabbanim there called him out during the Shia, the Gemara Shia, and they said to him, could come into the office and said, listen, we have a very, very hard thing to break to you, but we made the inquiries that we had to make, you know, and you're not really Jewish, but you have an option. You can either go home or you can convert, you know, it's your option. And this b boy was already quite, a, quite involved in the yeshiva and he's a good learner. And he said, Rabbi, I'm going home. I, you know, I'm, I, I, I don't need this. I, I'll be a good guy. I don't need this. And he closed the Gemara and he left and he went home. And you know, like everybody that you know, knew him was like taken aback. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, we say in the morning, you know, Shaloy Asani guy, you didn't make me a guy. But there are always thoughts inside of us that are questioning, well, you know, if I could be born again, and I had every choice in the world. I could be anything. I could be a righteous Gentile or I could be a religious Jew. Based on how much I trust and delight and embrace my true identity as a religious Jew, that's how much value, how much depth, how much meaning everything I do in Judaism really has. 100%. 100%. It's the same in marriage. As much as I embrace my spouse and trust that my spouse is my soulmate, it's divinely orchestrated and engineered, and this is where my perfection lies. This is where I, my journey of trust is. This is where I'm going to realize my wholesomeness and my joy. The more I can make that leap of faith and trust, the richer, the deeper, the more meaningful, and the more real, and the more shechina there is in my home. Ish ve'isha, shechina shruya b'neim. When there's car, when there's total oneness, there's the shechina that shruya b'neim. If not, there's fire, because we're always living in a power struggle and a zone, and I'm defending myself, and you're defending yourself. So it's all about trust and making that massive leap of faith, jumping into the sea. And when we jump into the sea, even though sometimes it feels like ah, the water split. Batach Bale Baila, the Shalal Lai Echsa. So I want to just end by giving you all a bracha that we should be able to take this message of trust and belief and leap and affirmation, verbal affirmation, because without verbal affirmation, constant verbal affirmation and constant trust that even though we're fighting, we know how to fight. <laughs> it's true. We're in it. You're disappointed. But I trust there's nothing malicious because we're really destined for one another. And then I don't have to put on my boxing gloves, put on my bulletproof vest. I don't have to get into it, into this power struggle mode. I'm not in the survival mode. I'm in growth mode. I want to hear. I want to listen. I trust that you're not out to get me. You're frustrated. And you, okay, let me see how I can listen, how I can hear, how we can grow together. And then we can actually empower each other to realize our deepest aspirations, which is to be true to one another, to live for one another, to live with the Shema Yisrael Hashem Alekeinu Hashem Echad, the covered of Kvod Malchusay, the Va'ahavta of Va'ahavta Hashem Alekecha, and the Vashinantam to truly learn. Life is a journey of learning each other and growing with each other. All the best, everybody. Onwards bound, upwards bound, inwards bound. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rabbi Rai.